Greetings, Rooted Fellowship. Uh, it's Sisha here once again. Um, we have been going through a series, an Advent series, the Songs of Advent. And it's been a privilege for me to be really teaching and walking through uh, these songs with you that we see in the book of Luke. We have seen uh, the Song of Mary, and we learned some few things there, the Song of Zechariah, the Song of the Angels. And today we are in the Song of Simeon. The song of Simeon, that is a song we see in Luke, in Luke 2, uh, from verse 25 all the way to verse 35. That's what we're going to be looking uh, at today. I thought as we start looking at the song, I would sort of frame our thinking and frame our uh, sermon, uh, thinking through this text, um, around this question. Have you ever been in a situation, in a situation when things have gone wrong, terribly wrong, and you've looked around and you th thought it through, whatever the situation may be, and you've thought to yourself, man, I can't fix this. And I, I can't fix this. You, this. Just the conclusion, whatever that has happened, and you think to yourself, I, I just can't fix this. Have you looked at the, around the world, looked at the world, the complexities of the world, and maybe read stuff on the news, the injustices, the inequalities that we live with, and you looked around and, and you said, man, this is beyond me. I, I can't fix this. I don't know who can actually fix this. You know, maybe driving in, in winter around the city um, and you looked at homelessness, people who are in need, suffering, and, and you looked and you thought about it. How can this be fixed? I can't fix this. I actually don't know who can fix this. Some of us are, will be with our families this Christmas. And sometimes that's not good news for some of us. You know, I know for some it's really great, looking forward to it. But for some of us it's not good news because of the brokenness that's there in our families. Relationships that have been broken down. And you have tried to fix them. You have tried to work things out with some of the people in your life. But sometimes we get into a place where we think, I can't fix this. Maybe that's happening in your family, and you're just thinking, I can't fix this. Or even looked inside yourself, not just out there, inside yourself. You've seen shame and guilt that's there, and anxiety, and all of these things that have become permanent residence in your life. And you've thought about it and concluded, actually, I can't fix this. Or maybe you've um, made a big blunder in your life. And now everyone has, you know, you know you've made this blunder and, and, and everyone has, you know, seen you through that. Or you feel like everyone sees you through that, rather. You know, this mistake you've made, this mess you've made. And now everyone just looks at you. When they look at you, they think that. No matter how much they have forgiven you. No matter how much they have said, no, this is just water under the bridge, you can see that they still haven't forgiven you. That there's this stain that's just there forever. And you've looked at it and you said, you know what? I've said all I could say. I can't fix this. Maybe you've looked again inside yourself. The love of money the love of stepping up the corporate ladder that has turned out and made you a cold person, a transactional person, and you just think about it and you say, actually, I've gone too far. I can't fix this. Sometimes that's where we get in life. We look around what's happening around us. We look around within us. There are things that happen that we just say, man, there's no way to fix this. There's no way to fix our world. And, and that's the question, or that's the, 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 the place that Advent gets us into. The, 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 one of the purposes of Advent, of this season of Advent, is to give us that, that experience where we are at the end of ourselves and we just say, we can't fix this. We can't fix our world. We can't fix ourselves. And in Advent, we are meant to face the reality that we cannot fix ourselves and we cannot fix the world. 
And these songs of Advent, the songs that we've been looking at, the songs from most of these people, Mary, Zechariah, uh, Simeon today, most of these people, they are responding to the news and the reality that someone has finally come who will fix the mess. That this broken world has, someone has come in, into the scene. Someone has come into the scene and this person will fix the world. This person will fix us. God's chosen one has finally arrived. That's what, that's what they are singing about. That, that's what they are uh, responding to. And even S Simeon in our text today, he, he calls the Messiah, he calls Jesus the consolation of Israel. And we'll get to what that means. He calls him the consolation. He's been waiting for the consolation of Israel to come. And the consolation of Israel has come. If you have your Bible, if you've got your device, come with me. Let's, let's read our text today from, from Luke chapter 2. I'll read from verse 25 all the way to verse 35. Let's hear God's word. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It has been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that, the, that, that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for, and for glory to your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. This is... The reading of God's word. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that once again we have come into your word. I pray that we would be those people who come to your word with humility. Asking that by your spirit, would you make your word alive in us? Would you make your word burn inside our hearts? What we do not know, may you teach us. What we are not, may you make us. Because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What we see in our text, again, as another response, is another um, song that we see in this, in this book of Luke by Simeon. We are introduced to this man in verse 25. It's just, you know, we are given his name, his address. This is Simeon, a man from Jerusalem. We are given a bit of, you know, his, his, his personality or the, the type of person he was. He was a righteous man. He was a devout man, almost like the same narrative like that, that of Zechariah. Here's the man who has been loving the Lord, righteous, devout, but he's been waiting. He has been waiting. And from get-go, we are told that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, the consolation of Israel is another word that is used for the Messiah. It's another word that is used, in fact, by, by the function of this Messiah, that he would be their consolation to his people. Consolation is, is another word for comfort. He will be the one who will comfort and bring relief to Israel. And Simeon has been waiting for this Messiah. Now, the Jewish people at that time, they've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for this new age of justice and peace that will come through this Messiah. The ancient scriptures had spoken of a time 
where all will be well, where Shalom will be the order of the day, where the wolf will lie down with the lamb, it says in Isaiah, where the mountains will drip sweet wine. I love the sound of that. It says, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of God like the waters covering the sea. That's what they've been waiting for. And they knew that right now, everything happening around them, they've been under the oppression of the Romans, they've, been, they've just been people with no direction, nothing, they've, be, they've, they've had enemies, God hasn't spoken to them in almost 400 years as, as we come into the book of Luke, it's been really dark for God's people. And they knew that everything happening around them, they can't fix this. They can't fix it. And they've been waiting for the one who can. And we see here, Simeon says, it it says Simeon has been waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now later he will say in verse 30 that his eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Now this is almost the same thing. That this Messiah, this consolation of, of Israel is bringing salvation. It says again here, it says, he is the Lord's Christ. In 26, it has been revealed to him that by the Holy Spirit that he will not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now again, these are all things that are meaning the same thing. The consolation of Israel, the Lord's Christ, the one who brings salvation. Same person. The one who will be the consolation of Israel, of Yahweh's Messiah. That's what the Lord's Christ means. Yeah, the Lord, Yahweh, and, and his Christ. Christ, again, is not Jesus' surname. You know, we did not have uh, Joseph Christ and Mary Christ and their little boy, Jesus Christ, the Christ family. No, the Christ was his title, the anointed one, the king. And he says here, yeah, the, 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 the Lord's Christ, the Lord's chosen one. The one who's the consolation of Israel is linked with the one who's bringing salvation. It's the same one. And what we see here, that the God's anointed one, God's king, the one who will bring comfort, uh, Luke here is, is, is sort of taking us back again. This was spoken a um, long time ago, it was spoken a long time ago, it was prophesied a long time ago in the Old Testament, specifically in the book of, of Isaiah, about the one who will comfort God's people. We see that, in fact, in Isaiah 40. I mean, I, Isaiah is, is another gospel in the Old Testament. It just speaks about the Lord Jesus in so many ways. In Isaiah 40, it says for, from 40 to 1 to 5, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her heart service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of the one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall be made level. The rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. These words are so similar to what Simeon is saying. This one, this, the one who will comfort God's people. The one in which John will come and and give and level the fields for him. Who will prepare the way for him. This consolation of Israel. Now, when we talk about, again, this consolation of Israel or or, or salvation, we, we need to look at it from, again, the Old Testament perspective. From the way even in Isaiah it was spoken to, when God's people were waiting for salvation, for the consolation, what were they waiting for? It is always interesting. I mean, it's always, um, what's the word for it? It, it? It's always responsible for us that when we translate the words, specifically in the New Testament, that we don't just pretend that these words are new words, the, the, the scriptures is a, is, is a book that is 
it's, it's, it's united. It's one book. And therefore, what we see in the New Testament, we always have to refer it to the Old Testament. The Old Testament has always been giving us pictures. And in the New Testament, we see, we see the substance of what the Old Testament has been speak, sp speaking about. So even when we look at salvation, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Salvation is not a new concept. It is something that's been there. And before we translate, translate it for ourselves on what trans salvation is, we need to look at what it meant for the people. So, so when Simeon is saying, you've seen the salvation, are we talking about the same salvation that we think salvation is? So it's always good for us to go back and think, what does this mean? So even when we see Isaiah, that the one who will come and comfort God's people and bring this consolation, it says here that, they will, that their sin will be paid for. So part of that uh, salvation, part of that consolation will be the atonement of the sins of the people. But also, it has to do with their enemies. Their enemies will be scattered. The enemies, God will rescue them from their enemies. Now again, in Isaiah, in, in Isaiah, God's people at that time, even the comfort is coming from that God's people were still dealing with exile. So even for them, God's people, salvation, and all of these things bring all of that together. The rescuing from enemies, the return from enemies, exile for the restoration of the glory of the Lord. That's what we see even here. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And the glory of the Lord in the Old Testament was this whole thing of God coming back into the temple. And the temple of God being filled with glory once again. Rescued from the enemies, return from exile, restoration of the, of the temple of the glory of God, and the renewal of their calling. Remember, Israel has always been called to be the light to the nation. So even the renewal of their calling will be part of this wholesome salvation. So even then, when we look in, in verse 30, verse 29 and 30, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, as you have said in the Old Testament, you now dismiss your servant in peace. Simeon is saying, I can now die. You can now, I can be released. For my eyes have seen this salvation that we've been longing for. This salvation that we've been longing for. So even when we speak about salvation, for us, New Testament people, we have to think about it holistically. That yes, Remember, it is rescue from our biggest enemy, sin and death. It, it, it is rescue from sin and death. It is return home to the Father. That at the end of the day, our salvation will be when we are finally home with the Father. We are still people in exile. That our salvation will be completed when we get home. It will also be the restoration of God's presence with us. The restoration, that's why we, 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 we sing in, in, in Advent and we think about God being with us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, that's part of our salvation. God is finally making his dwelling among his people. But also the renewal of our calling. Us reflecting God's image in the world. It is part of our salvation. It is part of what it means to be people of God, that we have a calling, we have a purpose in this world. That's what it's all about. And Simeon is saying, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And what he does, he, he expands again in this salvation. What does it mean for us to have this salvation? And I want us to think about that. Well, for, for, for Jesus to come in as this Messiah, as this consolation, not just of Israel now, but of the world, the one who is coming to fix what's been broken, that longing in us that makes us say, I can't fix this, that's the longing for the consolation of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's that longing, and he brings that holistic salvation. 
God is not trying to, salvation is not about us getting better somehow. Salvation is for us to be becoming whole. For us becoming whole and, 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 and renewing our calling, reflecting the image of God in this world. It is part of our calling. It is part of what we are saved to. But also it says this salvation in verse 31 is for all people. Remember it says in, in Isaiah, remember it says in Isaiah that all people will see it. All people will see it. Simeon says it here, which the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people. The salvation is for all people. Now sometimes we can just, you know, walk past that. Be like, of course, for all people, great. But actually, going back to, the, to that time, that was a big thing. This, this Messiah is bringing salvation to all people? Are you talking about the Gentiles? Are you talking about people outside the covenant community? There's no way. But this is a breaking ground. This is a breaking of ground. It is for all people. Even for us today, we can, as much as we know that it's for all people, some of us, we think actually it is, but mm, not really. Not for that person. It's not for this person. And for some of us may think, even think it's not for me. It is for all people. It's for the religious. This is coming for the religious. When, it, when, it, when, it, when, when we see the gospel, remember Luke here, we're just looking at the, the beginning. The, 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 as the gospel is unfolding, the, 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 book, the, the, the book of Luke, we, we, Luke is going to show how this gospel is for all people. He's going to speak the, to the religious. That there are those of us who think we've got it all together. There are those of us who think just because we do this and that, that is what makes us, say, you know, be good with God. No, 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 no. The gospel, free grace of God, is for even the religious. It's for the ir irreligious. Those people who are thinking, I'm, I'm just far away from God. It's for you. It's for the irreligious. It's for the religious. It's for the rich. It's for the poor, it's for the outsider, it's for the brokenhearted, it's for all people. In fact, what we see in the narrative, I, I think that the Bible is so beautiful because once you get to understand these things and you see them unfold, you're like, oh, this is what he's talking about. When you start reading the book of Luke, the, the, the one main theme of the book of Luke, Luke is showing that this Messiah is for all peoples. He, he, he does his parables. He showed Jesus speaking to the, to the, to the, to the rich, the rich fool, the, the, the rich young ruler. That's, that's, that's a del a, a deliberate. Why is Jesus bringing the gospel to the rich? He, he's bringing the gospel. He's speaking about the good Samaritan. He's speaking about the, the prodigal son and his brother. The, 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 the persistent widow, the Pharisees, the tax collector, these are the all people that this gospel is for. And we see it unfold in the book of Luke for the lost, for the least of these. It is for all people. I don't, I don't know who I'm talking to right now. I, I know that sounds so cliche, but there's a sense that someone watching things that is not, this is not for them, listen, this gospel is for all people. And not just because it is offered for all people, because all people need it. You need it. There are things in your life that you know that you can't fix. There are things in your life that you know you cannot fix. It is for all people. But he continues to say, still talking about this salvation, in verse 32 he says, it is a light, of, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. Again, this glory that is being revealed. But also this light, this light of revelation to the Gentiles. Now, when, when the New Testament, or even when we see these 
again and again, talking about Jesus, the coming of Jesus as the coming of light. We see that in John 1, this word that has come, and, and it shows that it, the light has come. And, and again and again, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus himself, he says, I am the light of this world. The assumption there is we are in so much darkness. The assumption there is this light that is coming, he's coming because we are in so much darkness. Um, an author that I, I, I love very much, Fleming Rutledge, she says in, in a book on Advent, she says, Advent begins in the dark and moves towards the light. But the season should not move too quickly and too glibly, lest we fail to acknowledge the depth of darkness. She's saying, let's not move quickly. Let's think about the darkness. I know we're moving towards the light, but Advent begins in the dark. And, and then she continues to, to, to say, Advent, Advent beads us to take fierce in, in inventory of the darkness. The darkness without and the darkness within. Advent calls us to take a look around at the darkness. As we celebrate and think about the coming of light, to truly understand the light that the Messiah brings, we need to take stock of the darkness around us, the darkness within us. To say, man, I can't believe how dark it is outside. I don't know if you've woken up maybe in the middle of the night or, or you've just looked around, you looked outside and you just see it's so dark and you're like, wow, I just can't believe how dark it is outside. A darkness of, of, of a world entangled with sin. A darkness of a world marked by violence. A darkness of a world marked by racism, injustice, a, a global pandemic. I can't believe how dark it is outside. Can you believe how dark it is outside? Not just darkness out there. Not just darkness outside, but also darkness within. We need to take stock. The darkness that we see even in, for, for, for in our own lives. The darkness that, that we like to shake off in our lives. Sometimes it could be just something, a darkness that is, it's, 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 it's just based on a situation we are in right now. When will this crisis that I'm experiencing be resolved? I'm in the dark. I don't, I don't know. I'm facing so much right now, and I don't know when the light will come. I'm in the dark. Situationally, just right now. The darkness because we don't know what's, what's ahead of us. There's, there's no, it doesn't seem that there's a light in the, at the end of the tunnel. What should I do next? I don't know. I just, I just um, heard from a, a friend of mine who... The, 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 they just received the news that their that job won't be taking them back. And, you know, they've just, as, 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 the, as December ends, January, they, they have to look for something else. And he was just saying, man, I, I have to feed my family. I have to try and get something quickly. He's thinking, what should I do next? He's, a, he's in the dark. Maybe you are in the dark but also existential darkness. Something just deep. Will I ever be happy? Will I be ever be satisfied? Is God at work in my life? I feel like I'm in the dark. A darkness of depression that, that you can't seem to shake off. A darkness of a couple Wondering, will we make it? They're in the dark. Advent is here to remind us, yes, there is darkness, but the light has come. The light has come in the person of Jesus Christ. I like what it says in Isaiah 9, again, one of those prophecies about the Messiah. It says, the people walking in darkness have seen great light. Or on those living in, in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. There's a new dawn. 
I know in this country we sort of used with that, we used with that phrase, but this is the, the reality of this phrase. There's a new dawn coming with the coming of Jesus. And the Bible is so clear that, that, that there are people walking in darkness, but they've seen a great light. There's a glimpse of light coming. And for us in Advent, we are celebrating that the light has broken in into the darkness. And the good thing about the Messiah, the good thing about the coming of this consolation is that he beats us to be, to be honest with the darkness around us. And that's, I, I would say that to us. Be, 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 be honest with the darkness within you. Say, yes, there's so much darkness. But praise God, the Messiah has come. Praise God, there's one who can fix this. Because I can't. And lastly, it says, in verse 33, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Now remember, Simeon is holding this child. And he's saying all these things. He's holding this child. And lastly, he says, Simeon blessed them, the, 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 the parents, and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising for many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Wow. Merry Christmas to that. This, this child will bring some sort of division. It's destined to cause some falling and rising of many. This child will be a sign that will be spoken against. In other words, people will be polarized about this child. Many will oppose this child. This child will cause conflict. This child will bring some sort of polarizing views and opposition. And we need to to, to, we are witnesses of this. We know that. That living in the way of Jesus will give you conflict, whether you like it or not, with people around you, with the world around you. I mean, just living an honest, godly life will, will cause conflict. Not even conflict that you're trying to, you know, to, to, to be you know, deliberate about, but, but that living an honest, godly life will expose gossip in the office will expose corruption in government, will expose racism in the neighborhood, just you being there, living in the way of Jesus. Someone once said, the manger at Christmas means that if you live like Jesus, there won't be room for you in a lot of inns. Just there was no room for him in the inn. There will be no room for you in, in a lot of places. This child will bring divisions. And historically, we've seen that. The exclusiveness of Christian belief, of Christian faith, and the conviction that Jesus is the only way to God, that, that puts a, a collusion with different people. And we've seen that across history, that, that Christians appear to be a threat to a whole social order in different places. Early Christians were, as a result, often were exclu excluded into things, excluded into governments, excluded into jobs, cut out of business opportunities, and, and sometimes physically abused and imprisoned. We've seen that across history. This child will bring this. And today, in our, sec in our secular society, we are seeing that, that in increasingly in our culture, it's a threat in a social order. In increasingly in our culture, something is happening because of this child who was born. Now, there's a danger about talking about that, you know, that just being a Christian it will cause all of this because Christians are flawed human beings themselves. And often we, 
you know, some of these things happen because of our own hypocrisy and, and, and bigotry. So sometimes it's just easy to say, oh, yeah, they're persecuting us, but we must not do that to justify our own flaws and missteps and, and just put that we are being persecuted. Sometimes it, it's just people being, people being offended by us because they have a right to be offended by us. That's not an excuse. But at the end of the day, with all of that, with all, our, all, all, all of our you know, good intentions, all of that, there will still be polarizing views of this child. It's almost like what Peter said, this stone will be a stumbling stone to some. And Simeon is saying that, that there'll be offensiveness to Jesus himself. And every time and, and a place that he will find ex expression, there will be offensiveness. The coming of Jesus into our lives, it, it makes us, you know, peacemakers, but it also brings conflict. If you are a, a committed Christian, you will know that you, you, there will be times of peacemaking, but also there will be times of opposition and heartbreak. But it won't just be outer conflict. This child will also bring conflict even within ourselves because we have chosen the way of this child. Even our, with our, within our own souls, it says that about Mary, the sword will pierce your own soul too. This will even come and pierce our own souls. If you love Jesus and have him in your life, a sword will pass through your heart as well. There will be inner conflict, sometimes confusion, sometimes great pain. Sometimes you will get things wrong. You, you will fight with God. And you may even fight with yourself. That conflict. The things I want to do, I find myself not doing. The things that I'm not doing, I'm supposed to do. There will be this conflict. You know, when you put your faith in Christ, many struggles end. You know, many struggles are supposed to end. The struggle to prove yourself, the struggle to find an identity in something, the, the, the struggle to have a meaning in life, uh, you know, in, because of this or that that we, that we find in this world. The, the, all of these things are supposed to, to sort of cease because we have found meaning in the Lord Jesus. But at the same time, there are struggles that start because of our faith in the Lord Jesus. You are no longer at peace with your anger. You are no longer at peace with your greed. You are no longer at peace with your hypocrisy. You are no, this child has brought that, that sword. You are no longer at peace with your dishonesty, with your lust. You are no longer at peace because of this person, of Jesus Christ. This is what Simeon is saying. He's saying, my eyes have seen salvation. I have seen God's Christ, the chosen one, the consolation of Israel, the light of revelation to the Gentiles. He has come in the person of Jesus Rooted fellowship. Here's my prayer for us for this Christmas. And by the way, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And, and here's my prayer for you this Christmas. Can we revive our wonder for Jesus this Christmas? I know a lot of things have happened. A lot of things this year. But, but my prayer is that God, God has come near us in, in, in the person of Jesus. Can we revive May, may that be our prayer. Lord, may you bring back the joy of our salvation. May we also be like Simeon to say, we have seen this salvation. This salvation story has touched me. May we revive the wonder of Jesus. My prayer for all of us, the Lord, may you bring back the wonder the joy, the peace that we once had about Jesus. May you revive us. 
may we once again say, wow, how I love Jesus. Because friends, uh, l- l- let me tell you about this Jesus. He is still the consolation of the world. He is still the comforter of the world. He is still God's salvation personified. He is still the creator and the sustainer of the whole world. He is still the seed promised to crush the serpent's head. The Lord Jesus. He is still the seed by which all nations of the earth will be blessed. He is still the one greater than Moses who will rescue people from slavery and death. And he will lead us to a greater and finished salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is still the great high priest who is able to sympathize with us at every point. He is still the fulfillment of God's promises. He's still the mighty conqueror. He's still the only one who can break chains of of cycles of sin in our life. He's still the king of kings and the lord of lords, the Lord Jesus. He's still the one building his holy temple made of living stones. He's still the one who's preparing the place for us. He's still our hope in suffering. He's still the reason for us to sing. The Lord Jesus. He is still the source of all wisdom, the only wise God. He is still the prophet whose words will never fail. He is still the Lord Jesus. May you revive our wonder of the Lord Jesus. May we sing like Simeon, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. We can now die in peace, for our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people. Lord, may you show us Jesus once again this Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of us. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the love of our souls. Thank you for this great Messiah. Thank you for the one who comes to fix what we can't fix. Lord, revive our souls. Revive our love for the Lord Jesus. That's all I'm praying for 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 us this Christmas. May we love him more and more because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.